Welcome to Creating a Life in Music. My name is Mike Salo. I'm a guitarist and music educator from Minneapolis, Minnesota in the US, and I wanna know how other musicians make their living, how they got there, how they sustain it, and most importantly, the insights and tips they may have for the rest of us. I interview musicians from all over the world, from various parts of the music industry to break down the question, how do I do music full time? So join me as we discover the many different ways to create a life in music. If you're a guitar player who's ever wanted to attend music college but couldn't because it's too expensive or too far away, or maybe you're just beyond that point in your life and you're just too busy with your own family and your own career to commit to something like that, I would highly recommend going and checking out fretboardbiology.com. At only $29 a month, Fretboard Biology takes out all the guesswork, putting the right things in the right order. It's highly structured, highly organized, college-level guitar program designed by one of the top guitar educators on the planet, Joe Elliott. Joe was head of the guitar department at McNally Smith for a number of years, where he designed the entire guitar curriculum, as well as being head over at Musicians Institute in Hollywood for many, many years. He knows what you need to know. And you can get 50% off your first month when you go to fretboardbiology.com slash register hyphen salo, my last name, that's S-A-L-O-W. So fretboardbiology.com slash register hyphen salo okay um, you're the first person i have had on that uh that i talk to frequently like all the time so you know usually it's like hey and then catch up and then talk and it's like oh hey joe um, well, we can pretend we can pretend yeah yeah i never haven't seen you for so long that's right um so i mean i told you all about it so the whole point is is breaking down how to create a life in music. So how to, how to build a career and essentially help people and guide people essentially what you did at McNally Smith. So that's the whole kind of idea here as we kind of uh, direct the conversation kind of always towards that of like, you know, how did you develop your career and how do you help others develop their career basically over the, over the, over the span of your career? How have you helped careers be careers? to be yeah it's, well it's been kind of a career thing you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um i mean i know everything i feel like i know every uh your backstory but um if you could start like kind of where where music began and, and how you ended up going to school for music and got into teaching at mi and the whole backstory how far back do you want to go that's a good <laughs> question <laughs> <laughs> How about like, um, uh, you know, I guess, I mean, cause I feel like all of that, is, every, every bit of information I think is really useful for, because, because I think people relate to like, um, whether or not their story matches up because I think that's the biggest thing for some people. And I mean, you probably know this too, where they, they'll say something like, well, you know, I didn't grow up around music or I didn't grow up, but like everyone I talked to so far, everyone has a different story. And that's the thing I people I think people don't understand and maybe need to um, yeah. hear from others. So so I think from the beginning, where did it all start? I remember being in grade school, wanting to be in a band so bad that I I I, I think I lied uh, to my parents that I was joining a band at my grade school, and there was no such band. And I went in the Sears catalog and saw I could buy a tambourine for two bucks, <laughs> and I ordered it, <laughs> but I didn't play anything. Uh, no, but I got a guitar when I was 13, and I immediately wanted to play in bands. Uh, as soon as I could afford an uh, electric guitar, I bought one for 10 bucks. Uh, you know, our school had a little, you know, electric guitar amp that I could plug into, and my junior high actually had a jazz band, like with a rhythm section, which was a huge plus because it forced me to learn to play chords and stuff. My dad listened to a lot of big band stuff, so I was sort of familiar with the genre, but I wanted to play rock tunes too. But I just I started figuring stuff out, figuring out songs on my own. I'm not really sure how it all happened. We moved when I was, uh, you know, a sophomore in high school, and and uh, the, the new town that we went to, Billings, Montana, there were other musicians. Uh, you know, I was getting better. I joined the jazz band there in, in the new high school. And I uh, started playing, you know, there were guy, other guys who played. The era was was probably maybe different now in that regard where, you know, kids put bands together. That's what you did. And, you know, you didn't know that you weren't very good. Well, you kind of knew, but uh, 
but that didn't stop you because you wanted to do it so bad. And uh, so, like, uh, and that's how it started. You, you just get guys together. And in those days, there were school dances and things. You know, there was a homecoming dance or the prom and those kind of things. And in Montana, where I lived, every little ranch town had those events. They had homecoming dances in the fall. And they had proms in the spring. So you could play gigs. You put your band together. And, uh, you know, I, I would go to the principal's office and get a list of all the high schools in Montana. And I, and I drew a map of a two, well, I drew a circle, a 200 mile radius around Billings where we lived. And I got the addresses for all these high schools, all these little ranch towns. I made up a little letter with the name of the band and a sample of our tune list. And I sent it out to these towns and, and I'd put like, dance committee or whatever it was i'd make up some line and then you'd hear back they'd never heard from a band before they were just like wow some people who play music we like want to come play here and so i'd get a phone call and we were booked all the time my high school band and so that was really you know i look back on it now that was really important how you learn to play in a band by just going out and playing these gigs you know you had to work up the tunes in somebody's garage or basement and you work up the tunes, and then you you just slowly figure out how to make the band sound good, you know. And then sort of re- repeated the same process in college. I went to Montana State, same thing, except at a little higher level, because you're older and more experienced, and you're mixing with other guys. And there were guys that were music majors and all that, you know. And then in the summer in college, we would go out and play. Uh, we would go on the road for two or three months. We would... Uh, go out and play in all the little, uh, well, we, we branched out of the little ranch towns in Montana. We would play in the Northwest. We would play in, in bars and all these towns. And the same thing, you're just figuring stuff out on your own as you go, you know? And um, then eventually that turned into actually a full-time road band that toured around the United States and Canada for four years. And of course that was at a much higher level because we were older and more experienced and, you know, there were more resources. So that's, that's how I got started. I don't think there was a time once I hit high school where I didn't want to, where I didn't, where there was a time where I didn't want to play guitar and play music full time. Right. What kind of band was that? They were all, you know, they were top 40 bands. So it was a mix, um, mix of rock and R and B and funk and that kind of stuff, whatever was on the radio, you know, you look at the set, I would imagine those set lists in high schools, everything from the ZZ Top, the Doobie Brothers, to Elton John and Earth, Wind and & Fire and Pacing the Sunshine Band and whatever was playing on the radio. AM radio was so different then. It was uh, all kinds of stuff being played, you know. So in what year was this? Was it like late 70s? Late 70s. 80s? 70s. Yep. Yeah. Because I'm really old, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the same time, I was playing a lot of acoustic guitar, too. I had a, a one of my mentors uh, was a couple, you know, at that age, when you're 16 or 17, if somebody's two years older than you, that's a big difference. So I had this good friend of mine named Russ West who taught me a lot of guitar. We were playing acoustic stuff. We were playing, you know, James Taylor and John Denver and a lot of original stuff that we wrote. And that was a completely different thing. So I was just in it all the time. I was just... Hungry to play, you know, hungry to make music. So, so that, you know, that I lasted. I'm oh, sorry, huh? go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, in my early 20s, we were on the road 12 months out of the year, playing six nights a week, 12 months out of the year. We didn't even have a home. We didn't have an address. Mail was sent to our parents' house, you know? Yeah. So, and that's the way it was for four years. And then know? from there, so you ended up, you ended up actually going to MI, is it correct? I did. As a student? So, like, what brought you, why did you decide to go there if you were uh, touring at that point? So, did you end up going, like, into your 20s is when you started at MI? Yeah. I mean, I heard about GIT when it was almost brand new. I think, it, you know, GIT got started in 1977, you know, by, uh, you know, Howard Roberts is the big name. Uh, that should be identified with that place. There are other important names, but without him, it wouldn't have happened. And, you know, he literally changed tens of thousands 
of lives in America of people of guitar players who don't even know he exists, you know, be, just because of his footprint of starting that school, teaching so many really great players or, or being responsible for their education. And then those educate, then those students going out and teaching their own students, you know, it was a very cool thing that he did where he actually did some systemizing of learning guitar so that you could, uh, absorb more information faster instead of everybody just scraping and scrounging to, you know, get a little tidbit here, a little tidbit there from some guy or listen off records. That's all good stuff. But if you got somebody like Howard Roberts who systemized it, all of a sudden you can really, uh, you can accelerate it. Your, 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 uh, uh, your, just your progress. You can speed it up so much that you get to a, 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 the next level faster than you would had you been doing it all alone, just, you know, picking up stuff here or there or learning songs. You know, it's really important that you do all that stuff on your own. But when you've got an opportunity to have somebody, you know, shoot you ahead three or four spaces on the game board, why wouldn't you, you know? Right. So, no, I heard about GAT when I was still in college. We were doing a, our, our college jazz band did a festival in Moscow, Idaho, at the University of Idaho, I think it is. And uh, there was a clinician there named Mundell Lowe, who was a, a, one of the original teachers at GIT. And I heard him play, and I went up ask, after the concert. I asked him, you know, who he was and where he was from. And he told me about this place called GIT. So I went to the Guitar Player magazine. I go, oh, there's the ads in the back. I got to go to this place. And it's in L.A., which was always my dream is to go to L.A. So I actually applied almost immediately. I got accepted. But then I went on the road. And I couldn't go. No. Oh. So I, I kept moving my registration. I'd call at school and go, yeah, I'm registered. Uh, I can't go for another six months because I didn't know how long we were going to play. But I did that for four years. I kept calling every six months. <laughs> so eventually, eventually we got off the road and uh, we moved to L.A. And oh. I went to school there. Yeah. So that was about, uh, I don't know, 1985, went to school there. And, um, you know, uh, it was great. It was a magical place back then, you know, because you had all your, you know, a lot of your heroes came through there. And then you met people that you didn't even know were going to be your heroes. And you go, well, who's this guy? Who's that guy? And, you know, and all of a sudden you're exposed to all this. And I did pretty well there. So I got referred to, to gigs by some of my teachers because I had so much experience playing, I could go out and handle some gigs, you know? So I had a great time. It was a, it was a really uh, transformative time for me because a lot of questions that I had accumulated, you know, being on the road and playing full time that would have taken me a long time to figure out on my own were answered relatively quickly by being around guys like Joe Pass, you know? and Scott Henderson, and Frank Mbali, and Don Mock, who was probably one of my favorite teachers of all time, Don Mock. If you don't know who he is, look him up. Uh, and I many, many seen. others who came through, who came through GIT back then. You know, you, you'd see all kinds of people. <clears throat> so being around all these people, it just it accelerated your ability to absorb information. And I was, and I was hungry for it. So yeah, as soon as I graduated, they offered me a job teaching there. So I went from graduating to uh, teaching private lessons right away. And uh, it wasn't too long after that. One of the teachers, uh, a guy who teaches at USC now named Richard Smith, he, um, left to go to USC full time, he left GIT. And uh, the guy who was in charge at the time, who's still alive, Ron Benson, great old guitar player. Uh, he called me in his office and said, uh, you want to take Richard Smith's schedule? And I said, wow. <laughs> so I get all of, his, all of his classes and stuff. And so I did, I started teaching classes. And then, uh, you know, that's how I got into the, the thick of, of um, of GIT as, as one of the staff members. 
If you're a guitar player or bass player, you should really have a copy of Guitar Pro Tablature software. I've been using Guitar Pro for like 15 years, and I really can't live without it. At this point, it's sort of an industry standard within the guitar education realm, and it's really easy to use. You can make all your licks and write out all your songs, and you can actually use it in conjunction with ultimateguitar.com where you can download Guitar Pro files and learn all your favorite songs. So I couldn't recommend this software enough. And if you use the code MikeGP at checkout, you can get 10% off your copy of Guitar Pro 8. That's Mike, M-I-K-E-G-P at checkout, guitar-pro.com. Yeah, and then for people who don't know, you also ended up uh, heading the guitar, the guitar department first after that? Yeah, after about, uh, I don't know how long it was, maybe, uh, I don't know, after three or four years, I ended up being the department head uh, of the guitar department. And then after a few years of that, by weird circumstances, I ended up being the VP of education of the whole school, uh, which was a, a, a weird thing for me to do. I never wanted to be involved with teaching or education, but, uh, I took a liking to it and I, and, uh, I didn't pursue that job. It just kind of ended up in my lap. So, but it was a, it was a interesting experience being in charge of 250 musician faculty members and then, uh, having there be 12 or 1300 MI students. Uh, it was a little bit like being in charge of an asylum, you know, <laughs> Being a musician, I think, made it uh, possible for me to 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 deal with that as an administrator because, you know, you knew I knew everybody really well. So, and plus, at the same time, I was I was gigging all the time too. So it didn't really interfere with. It was a tough it was a tough go because it was I was so busy. But but I uh, I taught uh, I taught and I played gigs all the while I was still. Uh, while I was in sort of the, the big boss, you know, but I kept my teaching some semblance of a teaching schedule, maybe uh, seven, eight hours a week because I like to teach. And so, uh, yeah. So my time at, at MI and GIT was about 23 years, mm. you know, 24 years. I was there a while. And then the whole time you were there, it was basically split between MI and gigging and then any like studio work at the time too, or. Yeah, by then the, the whole studio scene had, I, I'd say by the early 90s, when I was settling into L.A., the whole studio scene as it had been was really on on the fade out, you know. Um, the big, you know, people's home studios, professional home studios were becoming more and more the thing. And the group of guys that were really doing the heavy session work was uh, shrinking. And so you'd still have guys like Lee Rittenauer and Larry Carlton and, um, you know, all those guys and then some other guys who you never hear their names, <clears throat> but the same group of people were getting uh, a lot of the work, you know? And so there wasn't this, this um, I don't know if there was ever sort of a glut of studio work, but there was way more opportunity if you were a competent and semi reading guitar player in the sixties and seventies, and even into the early eighties, there was much more of an opportunity to do studio work. When in the eighties, late eighties and early nineties, I did a lot of demo studio work. I did some, some good stuff too. Uh, a lot of the good stuff you did, sometimes you didn't know what it was for or who the artist was. So you'd come in and they'd, you know, everything was, uh, like the charts would just have a, 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 a code at the top, like letters and numbers. And you didn't know what it was. The, the, you'd hear the track and there'd be a chord chart and they'd tell you what they wanted. Uh, a lot, very rarely were there exact parts written and there was no vocal track. And uh, so, um, yeah, the studio work uh, that was still left in the nineties for the people who weren't the studio aces from the decade before. Uh, a lot of that, um, a lot of studio work that was left over was for singer songwriters, 
that were putting together demos. I did a ton of that stuff. You know, where you'd go in and you'd work with a singer. And uh, it was fun. It was a good education because you always had to come up with parts. And, you know, some of that stuff made it on to final projects, but you never really knew. It was just, you kind of came in and did the work and you left. And mm. sometimes you knew what was happening with it. I did, uh, I worked with a producer from Taiwan. So I know there's stuff over there that I did that was uh, in in that part of Asia that that had some legs. Um, but the American stuff was all, all that stuff was, was taken up by the established guys. Right. And was, um, so I know not to, I guess, mention other names, but, um, like Carl Verheyen, wasn't he a big studio guy at, at that time or, or was he kind of the later, uh, he kept, did he kind of come in later? Cause, um, I, I, I don't know if, if I had him pegged right, but I, I, th- I thought he was always a studio kind of big studio guy in LA. He was, it was a little, mis- he didn't, he wasn't somebody who um, sort of uh, bragged about his work, but you knew that he was a heavy because of, <laughs> because of how much he was gone doing stuff, you know, okay. but he wouldn't come back to the teacher's lounge and brag about it. Like some people would, you know, <laughs> There were some people, oh, who, name you know, names. I'm not going to name anybody, but there were, there were all kinds of guys who, you know, I mean, ego, there's some huge egos out there, as you may know, that it kind of ruins your, um, I don't know. It's just hard. It's just hard to take sometimes when you, when somebody's, uh, it's so important for them to let you know how great they are. Yeah. You know, I think uh, these days, I don't know if anyone does that in person because they can do it online on their social media and just like this and they just share everything they're doing, which becomes a interesting thing because it's it's almost um, it's way more accepted because in a way it's like those people can actually get that out and and at the same time market themselves. Yeah. No, I mean, we all do it, right? I mean, I do it all the time. I'm online all the time saying, (laughs) Hey, look what I did. So I guess I'm a little hypocritical with that. But you can kind of do it behind a, a curtain, you know, whereas Isn't it different? Sorry, go back ahead. then, the guy, you know, I mean, I wish I could. You don't have to say it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Not, I'm not going to say any names, but you there's, told so me. Many, there's so many funny stories of guys coming, you know, either guys coming into the teacher's lounge who were regulars who were doing certain work and they would they would talk about it or guests that would come in and they'd be speakers and it, it was sort of jaw dropping how they would talk about themselves, you know? So, but you know, they're great players doing great work. It's just, it, it's just always sort of uh, left a bad taste in my mouth when somebody would go on and on and on and on about themselves. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I mean, I let, think that's, let the work, let, let the work <laughs> speak for itself. Yeah. You know? I think that's most people, you know, when, when you like, you know, I have friends and I have, I know people like that, um, have in the past, I've known people who have like just go on and on about what they're doing. And for me, I've, I've become kind of numb to it, but because I know the people, they're friends. Um, but I have had people where you don't know them very well and they're just like, Whoa, and you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, it, 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 yeah, it becomes a thing of like people who are listening. It's, it's, it's plenty of people talk about what they do, but it's a very specific way in the, I know you, I know exactly what you're talking about because it's a very specific way in, in the way it's presented. Like, right. I did, I did this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like one thing to be like, look at this cool thing I did to like your friend. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. As opposed yeah. to what you're talking about. Cause and, I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, there, there's nothing wrong with being proud of good work that you do. I think that's great. But when it's, when it's uh, there were some people who like to turn that into a, a tactic to make other people around them feel small. And so they use it to make sure that they're elevated a certain point above other people. And, uh, you know, that's when it's a drag. But the, but the reason, one reason it, it bothers me, just because it's wrong, I think, as a human being to do it, is I met so many great players who didn't do that, who were completely humble and totally cool and very um, eager it was their MO to try to build people up that were around them, regardless yeah. of whether they were on the same level musically and professionally 
there were people who were great about bringing people up, you know, uh, uh, making people feel good, encouraging people. Uh, because, uh, you know, L.A. can be a very um, severe put down place because that's what a lot of people do that. Not everybody there. I don't want to I don't want to bad mouth the whole community because there's a lot of great people who like to make people feel good. But the fact that you know the people, that some of these great players who are really try to build people up, that's the contrast between them and the really great players who are so uh, eager and willing to, to brag about themselves and, and knock other people down. That's why, that's why you, you see the contrast and you go, well, this person over here is, is a great human being. Why are you like you are, you know? So, <laughs> well, I got a really, I, I mean, got that, that lift up vibe a lot from like Brett, from Brett Gar said, yeah. like, he's great. Like he, super positive. Like I, I couldn't see him ever being like, Oh, he, and he's like a legend in, in my mind. Like he's just yeah, the Brett way is, the guy plays. Brett is a great human being. I've known him for 35 years. I don't know. And he's always been that way, you know? He's he's a very humble guy, but he's an incredible musician who makes incredible music, you know. So um, yeah, he's you know he's great. Uh, but but there are there are guys who play all different instruments who are very great about building uh, other people up. And yeah, uh, so I, I just think we have a responsibility. Now I'm going to get heavy on you. I think most of us have. <laughs> if if we when, when we mature as musicians and we've got a little experience under our belt and we have something to show for it, I think, you know, I think it's your responsibility to help, you know, help the next group of people along. You know, that was sort of the unexpected discovery I made about teaching. I like teaching. I thought, wow, this is cool. I'm, I, I can see that what I'm saying to these people is making a difference in how they sound. And that was really rewarding. It was kind of like a drug. You kind of go, wow, maybe uh, maybe I'm going to try to get better at this thing of teaching, you know. And then you start seeing, wow, this is really making a difference. You know, uh, it's a little bit like being a parent. I'm, I've got kids, you know. And when you're a parent, you uh, really like seeing your kids, you know, grow up and get smarter and become more independent and be self-reliant. And it's really the same thing when you're teaching. If you've got your, if you've got your uh, head and your heart in the right place and you're teaching, you really are rooting for your students to get really good, you know? Right. And I can point to all kinds of guys that uh, I know I had a little part in them, you know, getting, getting where they are. And it's, it's gratifying to see that, you know? So there, there's a, there's a lot of rewards in teaching. I think it sounds cliche, but you you know people say I learned more from my students than my students you know learn from me, and you know the thing is there is there's some truth to that. It may not all be music, but you learn a lot about uh, handling situations and personalities and all that you know. But yeah. you do learn a lot of, of music. I mean, there's I taught plenty of guys who you know they got chops for miles and they have musical skill for miles and you just go, wow. So how do you approach that? Like, so I, that's going to be my next question. Like, so, so I'm sure there are people who teach because I get people asking about how to teach lessons and how to start and everything. How do you approach um, someone that you're teaching that has that facility where you're like, wow, like you're pretty damn good at this point. Like, you, you know yeah, what, what do saying? you need me for? Because uh, I've had that feeling before with some guys, uh, especially yeah. at McNally. It's not so much now um, on my own because people, I think they have a, a gauge of uh, um, like they're they're not going to come to to me if they're at a certain level. Um, sounds kind of weird, but it, it's different at the at the college. At the college, you get assigned a student, and sometimes the student can just be like, "Wow!" Like you know, for instance, like Ethan Elseth was was a very strong student that I had, and I was like. He was a senior when he took lessons from me. And I was like, what, what are you looking for? Like, I was like, I, you're, you're into this like classical realm of like, you're really deep in there. Like, I don't know why <laughs> you're taking lessons with me, but I don't know how I can teach you much more. Yeah. Uh, but so I didn't know how. He was my private student too. Yeah. 
he was very strong. And especially by his senior year, he was like so deep in that compositional realm. I was like, dude, you've gone so deep in that further than I've ever gone. So like, I can help you with some technique, I guess. Um, but I don't know if, if you ever had students like, like how do you approach a student that's a strong student that, um, that because yeah. it maybe can feel intimidating, especially I, I feel like maybe when you were first starting at yeah. MI. Yeah. Oh, I was really intimidated when I first started because, uh, you know, I had guys in my classes like TJ Helmerich and, and Joel Holkstra, you know, these guys who now, and well, even at the time had, you know, great chops. Um, I think it, it, it's different with every student, you know, um, I hate to, to approach it from like, not a negative, but I'll tell you what I don't do is try to outdo what they do. You know, that's just stupid. And I've, you know, it's just, it's not really my personality to go, well, I'm going to compete with this person. Uh, you know, what I would always do is rely on my experience. Fortunately, I was making money for me. My experience is I was making money playing music when I was 14 or 15. That gives me certain skills that I have about um, playing songs, playing parts, uh, making good musical decisions, you know. Uh, so I would always go towards how can I make, how can I help this person be more musical with the tools that they have? You know, now that's pretty broad, but you got to start somewhere. So you go, well, that means when you say that, when I say that, I'm going to try to make this person more musical. That's making the assumption, or I'm assuming that I know more about what's musical than they do. And so you kind of have to, you kind of have to say, well, am I willing to take that risk of saying, uh, you know what, you're really good, but um, there's things that you do that I don't think are very musical. And here's what they are. So you have to have confidence, I think that you do have something to tell them. And so I've had, I had lots of students at GAT and I had a fair number of students at, at McNally who were physically better athletes than me on the guitar, for sure. You know, no doubt about it. They were athletically superior to me and always will be because, you know, there are athletic people on the planet and there are people who are less athletic. But there are a lot of great musicians, great guitarists who don't have Paul Gilbert chops, you know, uh, who don't play like Frank and Bali physically, you know, uh, but they're still, you listen to them play and you go, well, that's really musical. So what is it about what they do that's musical? So I think, you know, when you get a student who is physically advanced on the instrument, um, you have to focus on, you listen to them and you go, all right. I mean, we can all, we're all critics, right? Even though we, we try to not be, it's hard for us to listen to music without saying something about it. I really like this or I don't like that or whatever. But you listen with a helpful, critical ear going, you know what? When I hear this, I, when I hear you play this thing or that thing, here's something I think would make you more musical. And what is, but again, that's making, that's an assumption that you know more about what's musical than they do. And that's, that can be a, a shaky branch, but you know, age, I tell you what, I mean, the older I get, sometimes the easier it is for me to, you know, like when I finished, when I started teaching GIT, I was still in my twenties. Right. And I was teaching guys that were younger than me, the same age as me and older than me. And the older I got at GIT, the easier it was for me to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say sell or convince or whatever. It was easier for me to establish the fact that I was more experienced and I had something to say to them. But when I was uh, 28 or whatever it was, and I was teaching at GIT, uh, you know, there were guys my age who were going, who are you and what have you done? You know, there was always that. And it was be like, well, I can tell you what I've done. You know, I've been, I've played probably, you know, more gigs on stage than, you know, whatever the stages might be, you know, not glamorous stuff, a lot of it, but I've got more than 
half the faculty here, if not most of the faculty. I've spent more time on stage, you know. And because of that, I can tell you how to make a band sound good. I can rehearse a band. I can help you guys uh, make the most out of the skill that you have. You know, I think it's how people become producers sometimes, right? You know, when you're when you are helping a talented student, and we're talking about guitarists, maybe or maybe expand it to anybody, but uh, and there aren't guitar things that you can necessarily show them. There are musical things you can show them, like a producer would do producing a record. So let's say. You know, Mike Salo hires Joe Elliott to produce your next record. First of all, there's got to be an agreement and a certain amount of trust there. You're going to you're going to hire me to, to um, produce your record because you think I'm going to bring ideas and sort of channel energy in the right way to bring out the best thing in your playing. That's why you would hire somebody to produce your record. So you think. God, I could produce my own record, but it's going to just sound like more of me doing me. I need an outside, independent, third-party voice to help me get something more out of me than I'm going to get out of me. And it, I know you know what I mean by that. I'm the same yeah. way. It's like, God, I'm tired of hearing my opinions, you know? So when you bring in somebody else, that other person looks at things from a different angle. It's like when you bring in a consultant, you go, you know, to, to look at anything, not even musical, you go, why do you bring in a consultant? Well, they have a different perspective. So relating that to teaching advanced students, I think that you kind of have to take that angle where you're going, I can help you because I can listen to you uh, with fresh ears. And But the hard part is establishing that trust at the beginning that you do have something that's going to help them because if they just come in and go, Oh, you know, I can play way faster than you or look at me go from up here. And, and I go, you know what? I don't play that way. So knock yourself out. You know, <laughs> um, you know, some, for some guys, they never get past that. You know, they never get past that, that they're physically more gifted or whatever, but you know, I, I can always point, to my experience, my professional experience, playing and teaching and writing and all that stuff. And at some point you kind of go, well, you know what, if we're not a good fit, we're not a good fit. Yeah. And you don't stress over it, but trying to win somebody over in, in a competition, you know, I mean, so, yeah. It becomes a thing too. I think where, where at that level, if someone is, uh, is, uh, to a certain level uh, in their, in their playing, it can become a, a mutually beneficial experience where, where it's like, well, there are things that with any player, especially at a high level, it's like, there are things that, that I do that you don't do. And there are things that you don't do that I don't do and vice versa with anyone. Like, I mean, me and like Feely, David Feely have like, like he's seen things that I've done and been like, well, what is that? What are you doing there? Like, why, what, what I don't do that. And then like, I show them, break it down and then vice versa. Um, so I think there's that to be had. I think anytime you're next to someone, there's always something that, even if you're both at a very high level, there's always something that they do that you don't do. And then vice Absolutely. Versa that you could completely learn from. And especially, I feel like in that case of like taking lessons with someone at a college and then getting paired maybe with a teacher that doesn't play like you, I feel like that's when you go like, as a student, I think it's very important to be like open-minded and go like, what is it that this teacher actually does like their best? Because they're doing something at the highest level that I don't do because I'm over here doing this thing. So maybe I should actually just like try to suck as much of that out of them as I can. So like, it's like if you're, if you're taking lessons with a jazz guitarist and you're a metal shredder guy, you're like, eh. it's like, you should probably just take as much of that shit in that you can take in from that jazz guitar player. Even if you're not totally stoked on like learning that stuff, I think, I think it's a huge responsibility, not a huge responsibility, but I think people who are trying to go and learn from people need to go in with an open mind and go in with a, eagerness to learn and and uh just take it all in no matter what it is because uh yep. i had this yeah yep. i've had this thought recently people you know there's a lot of i had a conversation with a 
old student last night. He's actually doing a lot of really cool stuff online. Um, he's doing very, very, like very similar stuff to what I'm doing. Like he's posting video lessons and he's, he's doing it very well. He's a very strong player. And we had a conversation last night and I was saying to him, I was saying, just please never start a lesson with, you shouldn't play like this and play like this instead, or don't learn this, learn this. Like that stuff drives me nuts because it's like, what are we doing here? Like what don't, don't come in as a teacher saying, don't waste your time on that. Like what? I don't know how your thoughts are. I'm always like, Ugh, you should kind of be an open, an open like vessel of just like take in all the shit you can learn and just do it as best you can. And, 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 you know, sir, depending on what you're playing, I feel like, you know, it's, it's like, okay, I suppose you could go down the road of why are you learning country? Like if you don't plan on playing country at all and you're a metal guy and maybe there's some validity to that of like, you don't plan on making that a part of your career, but I don't know. I just feel like having that open mind to just take it all in is, is super important as a student. Yeah. And you know, some people have goals and some people don't. People do, who don't have goals will arrive somewhere I'm going to get kind of philosophical here. People who don't have goals are going to arrive somewhere because they're going to stay alive and keep playing. And they're going to evolve into something just from the, the, the stuff that they collect along the way. And people who are super goal oriented sometimes are very specific about what they learn because they're checking boxes on their way to some point on the horizon that they've, they've calculated what the route is and they're going to do it. You know, Carl Verheyen, you mentioned him earlier, he was, uh, you know, watching some of the seminars, the in-house seminars he did. He was very specific about his vocabulary, you know, and and he he talked about something that I still talk about all the time today is that, you know, every genre. You, you have to do when we play guitar, no matter what the genre, we're doing one of two things. We're either comping or soloing. Most of the time we're comping, you know, unless we're the star of the show and everything's about us and our guitar and we, we just solo and play lead and we comp every now and then. But most of us, when we play gigs, are comping most of the time. And when we do get to solo, we need to, you know, stand out and be expressive and and play well. We don't have to necessarily, it's not in everybody's wheelhouse to show off. But so when you think about, you know, when Carl Verheyen would, would uh, amass his vocabulary, it's because he did so many genres in the studio. I used to hear him talk about it all the time. And I would walk by what they called at GIT is open counseling, which is all of us had time on our schedule. We would just sit in a room with our guitars and a couple amps and students could wander in and could wander out. And a lot of great learning happened there. But Carl would, um, you know, his his vocabulary was vast, whether he, he could play great country, he had great country rhythm guitar chops, he had great solo chops. Same thing with his classic rock stuff that he did. Same thing with his sort of smooth jazz and fusion -y kind of stuff that he did. And he could play straight ahead as well. He was, he was I, I, I don't know this, but I, I, I gather from being around him some that he was very calculated in his the way he amassed his vocabulary that he knew for each of these genres, he better have, you know, certain rhythm guitar, in other words, comping vocabulary and a certain amount of vocabulary for soloing, you know, and then there's the other guys that are, that are the opposite end, somebody who specialize in one thing and they're just going to be great at that. And they're not even going to worry themselves trying to be good at multiple styles, you know, you know, that's one thing I always had just from out of necessity of trying to stay alive and play gigs is I played a lot of styles. You know, I didn't focus on one thing. Now, uh, certain styles suffer when you spread out your time and experience over multiple styles. You, you don't get you don't get to the same level as some people who specialize in one style, you know. There's just there's just so many different ways to go about your business when you're a guitar player. It's such a funny instrument that way. You know, we say, yeah, I'm a guitar player. Well, what the hell is that? All that means is that you own a guitar and you play it. <laughs> now, beyond that, it's like, well, what kind of guitar player? You know, you play lead or rhythm? You know, there's the, the question, you know, the old question. But, you know, how many people do we both know collectively that play guitar at a high level, but they're all completely different because of what their goals are 
what their experience is, what they do for a living. You know, there's great guitar players who don't play guitar for a living because they go, you know what? I don't want to fight that battle my whole life. I want a nice steady income, 401k benefits, and I want my wife to stay around, you know? <laughs> and so, you know. There's a dog right there. The hell, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize he was down there. I moved my hand and I hit him in the yeah. face. So, when you you know, when you're dealing with students, you know, you it it's good to find out what their goals are. What do they want to do? That can help you guide them. You know, always helps you guide them. There were, there yeah. are, there were skills, you know, I think there were skills that every guitar player should have, you know, it should be a certain amount of technique. That's uh, sort of uniform, uh, a certain amount of basic theory knowledge. That's very, helpful and help someone function regardless of the style of music that they play. You know, there's th- there, 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 there are things about playing with good time that are universal. Right. So there yeah, are yeah. always those, there are those common things, uh, things that are those skills that are common to all musicians. So, you know, uh, I've taught literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of students, thousands of students, either in the classroom or privately, most of them in the classroom, just because of, you know, where things life took me. Um, and, you know, the, so many of them are great players and are great musicians. And um, it's cool. It's cool to have been exposed to that. I consider myself really lucky to have been around that many guitar players who are already good or who are developing or already good and developing into, into better or great guitar players. You know, it's been a lot of fun. I got to say, and then just the faculty that I got to hang out with for years and the people I got to rub shoulders with or perform with, you know, it's a, it's a riot, you know, it's been a riot. I'm not done. I sound like I'm signing off here, but I'm not. <laughs> Hope I'm not so, done. so like for people that, that are listening, I guess, um, after MI then, so what, 2010? 2010, yeah. You... Yeah, well, it was it was lots of reasons it was time to leave L.A. And I knew about McNally Smith, and I knew about the Twin Cities, and that there was uh, quite a uh, vibrant music scene here. It was kind of a small-town music scene, but it was something that was very active. I knew there were a lot of players here. And I knew I was going to miss a lot of what I had established in L.A., but uh, I needed I needed the regularity of um, of a school gig, you know, and because I still had two two kids in school and uh, I made some contacts and it was a long process, but I ended up moving to, to Twin Cities and taking over the guitar department at McNally Smith. Yeah, for until what? So seven years. Until it closed in 2017. Yeah, so that was seven years. It went. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What a bummer. I still have dreams about that place. Weirdly enough. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it there. It was great. Well, it was a you know for anybody who's listening or watching this who may have been involved with the school as a student, you know. I got no reason to say this other than it's the truth. That was a really great collection, especially towards the end, the last three or f- three years, four years. That was a really great collection of human beings who were either on the faculty or in the administration who were really sincere about advancing uh, the, the prospects of, of the students that were there. Everybody was really concerned about the students doing well and going on to better things, you know, when they graduated. And, you know, in such a cynical world that we live in, and an even more cynical and cutthroat business like music, where, you know, we talked about all the egos and all that kind of stuff, to be in a place where students are sort of, um, I don't know, treated with their their goals and their their. Uh, feelings and all that were treated with so much respect by the faculty. That's pretty unique experience that most people don't get to live, you know, as when they're as developing musicians, most developing music musicians don't get to be in an environment where for three or four years, they're kind of safe where they have a chance to develop from 
being somebody with with sort of some raw talent into somebody who can go out and be a force, you know? Yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. You know, I saw it. I had 20, before I got here, I, I had 20 something years of seeing that stuff in, in, um, in LA at MI. I mean, God, it was just, it was just like, it was, it was sort of endless. The stream of people, you see these guys come in, you know, um, <laughs> who were really green had talent and within a year you're just going wow what what just happened you know um uh, and it's and it, you know the audition <laughs> set up that that mi had for you know for uh, you know major acts uh that were looking for somebody either a sideman or a, a, a band member you know um it was it was pretty it was pretty amazing to watch you know it's like that that whole dream come uh, true stuff. You you would actually see that kind of, uh, you know, Justin Derrico. I remember when he came yeah. through. You know, Justin came. He Play played his pink. ass off. Now he played he played his ass off when he came in. He was a good player, but you know he was totally green. He was a nice kid, skinny little kid from I don't know where he's from. Maybe uh, Tennessee. I don't know South Carolina. I have no I'm idea not, where he's from. I don't know where he's from either. But I had monster him in, player. I had him in theory and ear training classes and. You know, we hit it off. It was fun, you know. And then um, there was a, a, a thing that happened in MI called, I don't remember what the name of it was. It was a class run by a guy, uh, and I can't remember his name either, but the class, he was a guy that was sort of a matchmaker, like <clears throat> artists and management companies knew this guy, and uh, they knew that he knew lots of musicians. So he was like this conduit. So some management company would call up and say, yeah, so, you know, our band such and such is, you know, the guitar player is, uh, you know, he's blowing up. They got to get rid of him. Who do you have? You know, and he'd have a list of names and then they would have these. Uh, some of them were after a while, we established this pipeline at MI where. Uh, uh, God, the guy's name is right on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember. But anyway. We developed a, a thing where every week, at least once a week, in a room there would be auditions, and the band, uh, some major bands management would be out there, and there'd be like this. It wouldn't be there would be a fil filter si system, so there wasn't just a cattle call, but um, uh, you know these 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 people would come in and audition, and people routinely got gigs, great gigs, through that that. Um, that process, you know, you just go, wow, that's really cool. That a year ago, that kid was, you know, picking his nose in the back of a music store in in Lincoln, Nebraska, or something, you know. Yeah, and, you know, um, I, was I mean, that stuff really happened, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. Barry couple... Squire, that was his name, Barry yeah. Squire. <laughs> Barry was the guy, and then that... Barry, he 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 got his start doing this. He worked at the union the musicians union for years in, in LA local 47. And uh, somehow there he was, you know, the, the music part of the union's job, what we used to be was supposed to be to do exactly that. You know, somebody was looking, you know, and it still does it with orchestras and stuff, but Hey, we got to have uh, we need somebody for this gig. They call a union. All right. Send this guy down. If you remember the union, you somehow have got a stamp of approval. Well, the union became so weak in most places. The musicians' union, it was even in the '70s, it was it was pretty gutless anywhere except for the big cities like L.A., New York, or Vegas, or Atlantic City. You know, the union was still fairly powerful for musicians. So Barry came from that background, but he he had this thing going. It was cool, you got to say. One of the best things you can do as a musician is to protect your own hearing. I've been using these Eargasm High Fidelity earplugs for months now, and I really love them. They're nice and discreet, high quality, and they don't make any of the sound muffled. They let in the right frequencies that I need on gigs or at shows. You can get 10% off your order if you use code MSALO10 at checkout. That's my first initial M, my last name Salo, S-A-L-O-W, 10 at checkout to get 10% off your order at eargasm.com. Yeah, um, uh, quick side note. Uh, I actually... 
my the, I I wanted to move to LA. That was like my whole plan after McNally. Like I, I'm going to move to LA, and then I got the job at McNally, <laughs> so I stayed. <laughs> So I screwed you up, is what? No, 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 no. And uh, yeah, you, you totally screwed up my entire <laughs> fuck career, goddamn. No, no, no. I mean, you can still I, go there. Yeah, yeah. I say that. I say that. But um, that was the kind of the thing of like, oh yeah, th- I'll take this year, and I'm pretty much pretty much sure I'm going to go to LA, and then it just never happened. But the reason I bring that up is because like, I've been completely fine here. Like, got a lot of work. Um, been able to build work online and everything. So the reason I brought that up was because I want to know your take on like the idea of wanting to be a musician or uh, some work in the industry in some facet as a career and, and location. So like you were in LA, which many people see to be like the, like one of the big hubs and, and you decided to move to the twin cities because you had a uh, outside perspective on, on how you thought that twin cities were. So I want to know like, what your perspective or what your opinion is on like people who th- think they should be somewhere or, st- or here or there or, or whether going to Nashville or going to LA is the right choice for someone or, or as opposed to, you know, being in the twin cities or being in Chicago or being in New York or being in, you know, Austin or something, name another place, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, this is not a cop-out answer. It's really different for everybody. But I I think there's one thing that's really common. And, you know, some of it depends on your age and how far you've developed as a musician and what you want to do. I was from Montana, right? And there's a lot of good musicians in Montana. People kind of laugh about that. Oh, yeah. And I go, yeah, there's a lot of good musicians because it's so beautiful. People want to go live there, you know. I mean, there's, there's 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 a whole bunch of people who, I don't want to say they retire, they hide out there, but there's a lot of great locals too. But for me, when I was growing up as a guitar player, my heroes were in LA, you know, Robin Ford, Larry Carlton, you know, Uh, those guys were in LA. And so I thought, well, that's where I got to go. That's where the goodies are. (laughs) And that's where the, you know, the studio scene was there. That's where this, that, that was, all that stuff was there. I really wanted to go there. Um, But it's a different time now, you know, with all the online uh, magic that happens, whether it's, you know, being able to record albums uh, with with musicians from all over the world without anyone traveling, without, you know, with us being able to do this. I mean, we're we're 15 miles away from each other right now. I think you live about 15 miles north, but we could be, you know, we could be on the other side of the world doing this. Well, I had Brett on in Australia. Like, yeah. So, I mean, that changes, that changes everything. But uh, I like if, if you were graduating from McNally, say McNally was still open and, and there was a, there was a, 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 a guitar player student of your caliber who was thinking about leaving town and they already had something going here. You know, I would not discourage them from moving to LA, New York or or Nashville, or some other big hub where there's music. I mean, you know, you go to, you go down to the Miami area, you go overseas and play, you know? And and, and there, even though I think the Twin Cities people who live here, I don't know if they, who've always lived here, some have a perspective because they get out and travel and play around the world. Some people here, I, I don't know how good a perspective they have about the fact that this is a cool place for music. It's very supportive. But when somebody's in their formative years, let's say that could be anywhere from 18 to 30, I think it's a great idea to leave. You know, maybe not permanently, but you leave so that you go out somewhere else and you you got a different you got to get a different view of the world than than the Twin Cities. You know, right. I came to the Twin Cities well into my 50s. You know what I mean? I had lived, you know, I had traveled around all over the place playing and I'd been in, in LA for a long time. So uh, I had that perspective moving here. There were some things here that took a little bit of getting used to, but I would always encourage someone who's grown up in a certain area, not only grown up as a human being, but grown up as a musician, I'd always encourage them to get out for a while. Is that a year? Is that for two years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. 
you get out you kind of everybody's different your clock's gonna run different than the next person but yeah i don't it's, it's about pers- it's really about perspective that the perspective that you you gain the possible people that you meet i mean there's you know john robinson the guy who played you know the jr the guy who played on all these great michael jackson records and all kinds of studio stuff he's from a little town in iowa you know no uh, shit yeah Mike, you know, some Tomorrow other from- guy I know is from my, you know, I lived in Iowa oh, yeah. for a little bit of time. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, Mike Miller, great guitarist in L.A. He's from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you know. He is. He played on a Chick record, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he played on Chick Corea Electric Band 2. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. He's got, I mean, there's, there's some great there's solos guys, on that album. There's guys from from here who, I mean, you know, I mean, this this town is full of great musicians. Look at Corey. There's Corey, you know, he's uh, still, and, he's and still, Corey, Corey did his thing from here. I mean, yeah, he still lives here. He still lives here. So it's, it's a different time. Or like you know? Charlie, Charlie Engen, yeah. another person like so got that it, gig still yeah. here. It's a different time than it was when I was, you know, like the age of the people we're talking about where maybe it wasn't, you know, I mean, Prince did it from here, you know, yeah. And that was Prince was exactly my age, so we're the, the same age. So, but but I think for for the for the average person musician who's grown up in an area, I always think it's a good idea to get out at least for a little while and go. Then you get there and you look back at this place or wherever you're from. I mean, if somebody's watching this from Denver or Omaha or whatever or some little town, you go. You know, guys in small towns kind of got to get out of them if they want to play a lot. You know, you know, you're only going to you're only going to you're only going to go so far, I think, because, well, you just don't have the opportunity to to play with other people who are going to advance what you what you do. You know, it's tough. Yeah. Montana's interesting that way where there's it's a funny state and there's some really great players in Montana. Uh, I mean, some really good guitar players that live there. There's really good bass players, really good drummers. And we're talking guys that could live and cut it anywhere. You know, um, I, I would imagine if I understood the dynamics of other states, maybe there are other places like that. Montana's a funny, I'm sure. I'm funny, sure Montana's are. a funny place because there's a there's a certain thirst for for good music. You know, there. Um, you know, um, but you know, I, my my general advice always to students at McNally from here was go somewhere. You know. Get a taste and see what you think. See how it would go. I remember having that same conversation with some students, and there's a specific student coming to mind that I actually can't remember his name. Um, but he had this whole – we got along very well, but I don't think he got – I think he kind of uh, pushed buttons with other teachers. But he's doing some cool stuff now in L.A., and I remember, I remember him having a very clear goal of what he wanted to do. He wanted to be in a specific scene, doing a specific thing, and – it just all sounded like LA. And I was like, dude, like you need to go. I was like, you just need to go to LA. Like why just that, if you have this really specific idea of what you want to do and that's how you want to make it happen, like then just go, like you need to go and do that. Like for me, for me, a, I had, I had several kind of dream job uh, scenarios when I graduated. Like I didn't have like the one thing, like I was like, Oh, it'd be awesome to go to LA and like get in a touring group, like be, be like a side man. That'd be really cool. But I also liked, really liked the idea of teaching at a college. Like that sounded really exciting too, because I was teaching. So when the McNally thing like happened, it, it was like, I was equally excited about that as I think I would have been about getting some sort of thing in LA or Nashville or whatever, or doing that thing. It was, it was one, cause my, when I went to McNally and I went to music school, the whole idea was like, I just want to do music for a living. Like it doesn't matter in what facet, like I have kind of several scenarios in my head of how that could go. Um, but I, I just, you know, I, I, I need it to be music as a living. Whereas some people have that and they have more of like a very specific goal in mind. Like I know Charlie was like, I don't want to teach. Like he's like, yeah, if I got a teaching job at McNally, that'd be great. And I would do it. But he was like, I want to play, and I want to play in a, like right. a, a, a cool band, and I want to do that. And he and, did it. Um, and he did it. Yeah. 
And he, yeah, you know, I remember having that conversation with him and being like, 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 dude, I was like, Hey man, like you're a monster player. Like there's not many drummers out there like posting their videos. Like if you posted your shit, people, people think it was super cool. And then that's exactly what happened. And, um, and, uh, but there's so many scenarios with that. Like it's, it's such an interesting, I don't know. It's such an interesting conversation to have that, especially that Corey Wong thing. Like, like I feel like there's so much to talk about with, with his career. Cause I've been watching it over the years and I've seen him kind of like, he's kind of gradually turn into Corey Wong as he's seen today by many people, because I remember following him and I remember seeing his like fusion band that was it foreign motion or something or foreign something. I don't remember, but then I remember seeing like him posting about the green screen band and then slowly right. turning into like what he's seen now. If to me, like I visualize it as this kind of like this kind of thing happening and then pop, found it this is the thing and then and then getting with with wolfpack um because i mean i pay attention to all the guys like a lot of a lot of people in town and kind of see what they're doing and so it was very interesting to watch and see it happen from someone who didn't leave and so it's a good i think example of like don't necessarily have to be yeah i i do think however you got i don't know i don't know what your thought on this i feel like you got to be in some sort of a bigger area like if you're in like a small little town you're not really getting out you can't really get out and play with people you can't really get out and do the actual live thing like if i stayed in my hometown but i did what i'm doing and i, I could like say I, I let's say i did what i'm doing now but i lived in my hometown and and the, everything that happened before happened like all the mcnally us working together and everything but like let's say a couple of years ago i moved to hometown and still did the online videos there'd be no one to play with. There'd be such a s small pool of students to try to teach in that area. It would become this really hard thing to accomplish in, in the fuller spectrum. Um, and maybe that's what you're saying about like getting out and going somewhere. That's part of it. I mean, I mean, there's a lot oh. of things you said, bring it, bring up. Uh oh, idiots. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, the, talking about Corey and, and talking about uh, Charlie doing that, you know, that would not have been possible as recent as maybe even 10 years ago, but 15 years Oh, I think you're ago, 100% right, yeah. You know, and so you look at that and go, well, so the rules have changed completely. So the idea of leaving, you know, that's what I said at the beginning. I don't think it's as, as important for developing your career and contacts as it and your network as it was before. You had to leave. I mean, you couldn't stay in Montana and, well, I'll, I'll give you an exception to that uh, in a minute if you want. But now, you, you because of, of our the connectivity uh, that the Internet gives us, you could be anywhere, you know. Um, now, that thing about small towns, I, I agree. I mean, living in a small town, unless it's like there, there's a couple of guitar players I know really well in Montana. Craig Hall is one who lives in Bozeman, and Alex Norman is a guy in uh, Billings. And these guys are great players. I mean, they could literally move to New York or L.A. and fit right in with, with the best guys. They're really strong players, you know. And there's probably other guys that I don't know because I've been gone for so long. Um, but Montana has this little network of, venues you have to drive hundreds of miles to get to any of them you know yeah uh, but you know they found a way between teaching and playing their gigs and yeah. doing this in different kind of gigs that they forge out a living doing that you know so is there a way in rural iowa or rural nebraska or rural texas to to do it yeah but it's awfully hard because you have to it's such a physical effort to play with other humans you have to do you know, you have to do a lot of work to get out and do it. Whereas if you live in a city, you know, there are gigs that, that make it much easier to play with other people. And you, and you have to play with humans. I'm yeah. sorry. We saw I, it, what you said a minute ago uh, about being at home and playing. It just it. I remember us having this discussion in the teacher's lounge at GIT at MI many times about when things changed, like the, the sort of the DNA of the students that were the, the students that were coming to MI. There was a, a, t a period of time, like when I went there and when I taught there for the first, I don't know, must have been 10 years, 12 years I taught there, the people who came there had played 
live performances. And some of them had gigged a lot, kind of like I had before I got there. So you had people already coming in, understanding what it felt like to play in either a good band or a terrible band, but they knew what it was like to play on stage. And the kind of things, the kind of questions that come up about being a musician when you're performing. Well, when that started to change and fewer gigs were actually available on the planet for musicians to sort of cut their teeth and develop, we started getting these guys that played in the more of the bedroom players, you know, the people that they get physically pretty accomplished on the guitar or whatever it was that they played, but they had no experience playing gigs with other people. So you get this person whose skills are really imbalanced. There was imbalance big time. You had somebody with great chops, but they, you know, you get them in with players and they were like, what, are, what they're used to playing with tracks with perfect time and a dynamic are perfect and they're they're used to playing at their desk at home with their their favorite drink over here and the fan blowing on them and their track here <laughs> and they can get everything bounced like they're always in the studio but you get them in an environment where it's like uh maybe you know it's unpredictable when you're on stage half the time you know it's like that post we put up the other day it's like um uh, well you know the whole thing of of no sound check we're doing gonna do a line check and go and you don't know what is the dynamics gonna be like it's like that gig i did with david sanborn down in florida we had very little sound check you know and it was kind of hit it and go uh then the last gig i did with him was even worse than that I mean, we we didn't even have a line check it was just go and so the whole first tune is like oh my god do i you know do I hear the kick? Oh, there's the kick. All right, hear the hat. All right, bass is there. All right, I'm here. And meantime, while you're trying to play at a high level, you know, and, you know, you've got this, you know, uh, icon over there that you're playing with, and you're going, okay, so that in the in the course of a, the first four, five, six-minute song, you've got to sort it all out. These guys that were bedroom players, they don't have a clue about that because they've, it's like they're physically, you know, capable, but they lack a huge and a very important uh, it's an, sort of foundation of experience of that. I feel very lucky to have playing in, you know, that I gained playing in little dances in ranch towns in Montana where you're playing in a gymnasium and all you can hear is echo and then the next place you play is 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 drier than a popcorn fart. You're playing some <laughs> VFW, you know. And but you know those live experiences make it possible for you to adapt because I think uh, I think that's where there was a separation in the '90s where you, there was almost this. It wasn't a fine line. It was sort of this gradual decline in the experience of the students that came through GIT. You went from guys who gigged a lot to guys who just played in their bedrooms. That's so interesting because like, it, it, so there's so many things to talk about because we talk about small towns and I forget that like, I mentioned small town and um, uh, my vision, my version of small town is like, is like that big compared to most people. Cause I'm, I'm, my town is like 900 people. Like I'm from like a village. And so like, um, that's where I, yeah. Anyway, that's a whole nother story. Um, but, uh, it's funny, like being from this small town, I was from a small town, but I was from a relatively more populated area of Iowa. So Eastern Iowa has more small, has a, a lot of right. small towns in proximity. So like, yep, you've got, I know that, I know that I know where you're from and I know that yep. you actually probably could have networked if you were willing, if you had a reliable oh, car totally and did. could get to Des Moines and could get to Ames and could get to Moline and Davenport. And you could, you could have net, you could have probably set up a network in the region. Totally you know? did. Totally did. So like, so um, a small town I lived in 800 people, but like in, in any direction, there was about five to eight to 10 miles in any direction. There was another town of similar yep. or larger size. So there was a lot, I mean, my, my band, in high school was comprised of four different high schools. So I had a singer and myself from one high school, another guitar player from another high school, 
uh, the bass player from another high school, the drummer from another high school, because they were all so close to each other. Um, and you, you made friends because like, like, you know, everyone had like a family member or like a friend they grew up with that ended up going to a different high school. And then they'd be like, Oh, I have this friend that does this. And that's how I met the drummer. That's how I met the guitar player from the other schools. It was like a different family member or friend was like, Oh, I know so-and-so who plays guitar. And then you just network and you make friends. So I had like a band and we, we played all over the place. We played. So I'm by like Cedar Rapids, Dubuque kind of area. So we'd play in Dubuque, played Cedar Rapids, and then Waterloo and kind of play all around that area, Eastern Iowa. And that was like 16, 17. We recorded our first, we recorded an album when I was 17, like an hour away. I remember my mom was so mad because uh, I was like, yeah, I'll be home by midnight. And what happened was it went way longer than I expected. I got home at like three in the morning on a school night and after recording an album <laughs> and we ended up getting it recorded for free because he lost our whole first take he, his his whole system went down as he like his his computer well, uh, like but it crashed or whatever and this was like 2004 or something so like 20 years ago um that's really weird to say um uh, but <laughs> but uh, yeah but uh but um yeah so being from a super small town still made a band happen from like people from different schools and then went and played in all these towns surrounding we didn't play a whole lot because we were really wanted to play a specific style we wanted to write our own music we wanted to play like heavy metal so we wrote our own music and made an album and then played heavy metal so we only played so many certain types of places but we like forced ourselves into like certain gigs we forced ourselves into this like it was called like sauerkraut days or something in this town <laughs> we played these metal tunes and we're all like 16 i'm sure the people there were like what What's the fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what the fuck but like um yeah so I, we i mean it's so it's and i tell my students now that that story of like that that happened like i was like i'm from a town of 800 people 900 people like still made a band still went and played a decent amount and it was like even what i wanted to do because there's something about that age there's something about that age where you're not you don't really you're too naive to realize the ridiculousness in yeah how absurd it is what you're trying to do so you're like yeah. sauerkraut days yeah sure. like now i'd be like we don't fit that bill no no no, no. right, <laughs> like, right. But, but then you're like okay <laughs> you just yeah. go do it <laughs> and well, uh but that's yeah. but that's that's that drive you know there's a certain amount of uh god i don't want to be critical of it i I'm actually admire the naivety that i had and that everybody has when they're 15 to 20 years old or 25, maybe, you know, you've got this period of time that if you didn't have that naivety, you would give up. You'd go, well, yeah. this is insane. I don't want to do this. You know, I mean, I've had people I've worked with in uh, who, you know, they're, they're kind of nuts, but if they weren't nuts, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing and they would never advance the project. So they're, they're, uh, right. there's a line from the first Jurassic park that I, that I always, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. This is now where I thought this was going to go right now. Yeah. Well, I think it applies to what musicians do a lot. You know, uh, what was his name? Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. And he has a line, you know, he's doing his quirky kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, he would sort of calculate and observe and then make some statement. And he, he, would, he'd do this thing where he said, and life finds a way you know he did that whole thing <laughs> yeah. and basically what he was talking about is it's like an impression look oh thanks <clears throat> well, it's a good buddy of mine gave in la gave gave his girlfriend at the time what was her name uh oh, she's I famous no oh god gina gina, gina davis uh, yeah gave gina davis drum lessons for a while it's pretty funny he showed <laughs> up for <laughs> anyway, that's another story. But so that whole thing of life finds a way, you know what? It's it's really what happens with musicians. And that's why you can have guys like, you know, John Robinson from a little town in Iowa or Mike Miller or, you know, Tommy Boland's from Sioux City, Iowa. Tommy Boland, you know. And I think if you really looked up where a lot of your heroes are from, some of them are from, you know, from the big city, you know, you got Steve Lucas from LA and you got, you know, you got all these people who are from big cities, but there's an awful lot of people who are from the sticks who figure out a way, 
you know, like right. you did, like I did in Montana. You figure out a way because you want to do it so bad and you're so beautifully naive that you're able to power through these in situations that if you were older, you'd go, I ain't doing this. This is crazy. You know, you yeah. want me to drive 300 miles in a snowstorm to make 50 bucks. But that's how you get experience, you know. Yeah, I can't I've tell you that shit all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think there's there's a certain there's a certain thing that people who are really driven musicians they'll overcome all kinds of just ridiculous obstacles to learn to play and and have the experience. You know, we play music because we don't always feel great on stage, but when it doesn't take much to keep us going. You know, you have a couple moments of of pure bliss and joy on a gig and that can power you for months even if the next eight gigs suck you know you got you know you got half a set some night of of feeling really great the band's cooking you're playing good and then you don't feel that good about yourself for another three months and then it happens again it's amazing how that drives somebody forward you know yeah i think the same happens now i think for me it, there's a lot of different things that can that can do that. Like had a really good gig on Saturday that felt great. Played to a shit ton of people, huge stage. It was a lot of fun, and it was like that idea of like this. Yeah, I gotta make sure I never stop gigging because I had moments where I have brought dialed back the gigs and taught more, but I, never have I gone a year without gigs. Um, and some people do that; they just stop altogether. And I just feel like. I don't know, like just a little bit, even if like, if you're busy with other stuff, it's like, I mean, I know people who it's, it's so crazy. Like I know people who, who make really good money outside of music and they gig all the time and they like, they do very well in their own career, but they're always gigging every weekend. And it's like, I mean, I'm sure you know people like that where it's like, they don't do music for a living outside of uh, the gigs. They just, that they gig on the weekends and maybe they have a, a day job but yeah, I know people who just make a killing and then they just, they, they love gigging so much that they just make it a huge part of their life. And, um, I just can't, it becomes this thing of like, oh yeah, I, like people do, you do music for a living. You should probably be, be gigging. <laughs> well, yeah, for me, it's kind of an obsession. I mean, I take a lot of gigs that sometimes I go, why did I take that gig? But if I didn't take it, you know, I mean, I, you know, I've played my share of, of really great gigs, but if I go very long without playing a live gig, like two weeks or something, I start feeling funny, you know? So I play, I play, uh, I try to fill my calendar just because I think it's, I mean, I've done it since I was 14, 15 years old, yeah. right? I've done it's it for lifestyle. I've done it for, you know, 50 years. And so uh, if I don't play very much, uh, live. I mean, it's one thing to sit at home and practice and record, and I record a lot here, but there's just something about always um, working through, I don't want to say battling through, it makes it sound like it's miserable, but that working through all of the um, challenges that happen that are different on every live gig. Even yeah. if it's the same band, it's the acoustics, it's 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 how people's, what people's moods are in the band. There's always something about it that challenges your ability to make music and play well on a live gig. I just have to have my fingers moving and I have to be grooving with other people fairly regularly, or I start feeling like, you know, I don't know. Something's I start wrong. Feeling weird. I start feeling old too. You know, I start <laughs> feeling like, all right, you know, cause I know people who are in their thirties who start acting like they're 70, you know, you know, those guys, you go, He's already, he's just waiting to die. He's 35 and he's already go, well, I'm all set. This is what I'm going to do. It's like, wow. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I do have, uh, I work quite a bit during the week. So I do cherish my weekends off when I have them. It's very nice, but like, I haven't had one in, in a few weeks actually. Um, this week won't even be a weekend off, but when I get those full weekends off, it's like, Oh, I, I actually kind of enjoy them. Yeah, but well, I get it. I get it. I, I I like time off too. I don't. I don't take too much time off from. No, from you don't. Because of the the whole you know fretboard biology thing is so all well. Consuming, there know? we go. What a way to to wrap it up with fretboard biology stuff. 
Oh. Um, oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> so, well, before we get there, because I know you'll talk about that, um, and that's there's going to be a little commercial for it anyway during this that people will see. Um, but uh, I guess we can go in either, any order. So we can start with fibrobiology. So, like, the two things I ask people at the end of these is, is uh, like, one final kind of huge piece of advice or one thing you could you could kind of leave with everyone that that is your kind of like philosophy on 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 how to how did i word it here i have it i have it written down uh narrow it down if you could narrow it down to one solid piece of advice to a single sentence or small paragraph what would that be for like aspiring musicians or a music student um and another one is like what do you want to promote that you're doing <laughs> so yeah. you start with either one sure well, I, I don't know. One piece of advice is kind of hard. I mean, it's sort of one of those things. I mean, we're, we've already talked about it. It's, it's, it's more of, a, of an observation of everybody I know who's any good or way into music is, look, if you're really into it, you'll, you'll power through all the obstacles and you'll find a way to do what you want to do. And, and so I guess the, the word of advice or encouragement is look around at all the people who, who, who are making music, uh, good music, whatever that music is, you know, don't, I hate when I, I don't like music snobs, like style yeah. snobs or, Same. or skill st uh, snobs. Music is not the exclusive domain of the gifted or super experienced or super educated music is, is, um, it's for everybody. But, uh, you know, if you're really driven, and you really love it, you're going to power through the obstacles, you know, and it, it's just the whole thing. It sounds cliche, but you just kind of keep going. But the thing is, for people who are really going to do it, uh, figure out a way to either make a living or part of their living, you're going to figure out a way to do it because you want to do it so bad. It's like, you know, if you're Jones and for sugar, you know, if you know, you're going to figure out you're going, I'm now I've never done this. Uh, for sugar, but it's like, hey, it's 10 o'clock. I could sure use a uh, Reese's Buttercup. You'll go out to your car and drive three miles to the convenience store because you want that sugar. You know, it's the same thing with music. <clears throat> you go, God, I don't have any money. Uh, you know, I, I, I my lifestyle kind of sucks, but damn it, I, I want to play music. And so you do because it's what you like. So I guess it's it's uh, if, if you recognize that you're somebody who music is a big, is, is something that's so important that it makes you, it sort of fills a really important part of your uh, existence, don't be ashamed to, to do it. It's fine. It's, it's better, you know, it's a more healthy thing to do than, than uh, drugs, overeating, or, or any other addictive thing. Music is, it's an art thing. So it's a great addiction. It's, it's, and it is an addiction. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in a room where I spend way too much time doing all kinds of music stuff, you know? You mean I mean, Pro Tools over here where I sit and write. I'm sitting at a desk where I sit and write stuff. And uh, so, the, yeah, the advice is, you know, if you like it, you better do it. Because if you take it out of you, I've seen what happens with people who really need music when they subtract it it's never a good thing. It's like, <laughs> it doesn't, so it doesn't serious. end well. It doesn't end well. Music is a big part of you. You can't take it out of your life because you're listening to somebody or some social pressure that now nah, you shouldn't be doing it. You're, you're really, it's, it's, you're taking, uh, you kinda, some serious, you're taking some nutrition away that you need. And you kind of know, I feel like, I feel like if, if, if you are willing to do what it takes and do whatever it takes to make it happen, I feel like it's a very clear indicator of the fact that this is something that should be something you pursue and do. And uh, with a certain amount of self-awareness, because I mean, there's plenty of people who love to do music, but they're like, yeah, but I love it. But I really would like the stability of, of this thing. And I'll do it on the side. I feel like that's an okay thing. But like for me, I have about every couple of years. Um, well, typically it happens. Actually, that's not true. That's not true in every couple of years. In in the past 
uh, 15 years when something has happened that has been uh, uh, a hiccup in the career, you know, there's always that moment of like, well, maybe I should do something else. And then you start looking through the other stuff and you're like, no, fuck that. <laughs> and then you're like, I'm still fucking doing that. You know, I don't know. Cause I mean, like when Nally closed, I had that, that really like that, that like idea of like, maybe I should figure out something else to do. And then as I went down that rabbit hole, I was like, fuck that. Like, no, I really don't want to do that. I'll just deal with this. Cause I want to yeah. do this. <laughs> But anyway, that's a different yeah. conversation. I mean, it's it's everybody's story is different, you know. And and I mean, I've seen endless. I I, I could I could if I sat down and thought hard about it, I could give you probably a hundred pages of names of people that struggle with have struggled that I know who struggled with the decision. You know, I used to this is I this is kind of relevant. I used to tell students at MI all the time who would ask the, the kind of have this discussion of, Oh my God, I'm, I'm tortured. Should I do this? Or should I go home to Sweden and, and go to work for my father on the farm or whatever it is, you know, these people. And, and I would just give them an honest answer. And I'd say, I make a career decision every morning when I get out of bed. And you know, that, that was, that's kind of, now it's too late. You know, I can't, I, I can't make it. I'm too old now. Uh, but back then, it's kind of like you go, you know, I had four kids and a mortgage in, in L.A. And I'm just going, how the hell am I going to piece? How am I going to piece this together? My wife and I are working, you know, I'm working at the school. I'm playing gigs. I'm doing this and all that. And you just go, how are you going to put it together? So you kind of make a career decision every day. That's very different than the other kind of person that says, yep, I am locked in. I'm going to work at the post office. I'm. I'm, I could retire at 52 or whatever, and I'm locked into this this pathway, and there's nothing wrong with that. People want to do that. They can do it. You know, for me, I wanted to do something else, but it comes with this other challenge, which is you make sometimes you make a career decision every day. And you work yeah. for a long time. You just go, God, can I sustain this? And uh, But that's why, you know, that's why you become an adaptable human being, you know. It's very – on- it's very entrepreneurial. I feel like the, the, the path of music. I mean, I mean, well, and there's another good segue speaking of entrepreneurs and business well, owners. Yes. Joe, tell us about what you are doing and what business that you are involved in. Well, when McNally closed, I was thinking, God, do I want to move back to, to LA or whatever? And, you know, we had established a nice bunch of friends here and, nice circle of musicians that I play with that, that and uh, and we like our house and all kinds of stuff. We thought, I think we're going to stick it out here. And so a guy who was a student of mine named uh, Todd Bernson had looked at some of the books I wrote for McNally and said, hey, I'm, I'm condensing a lot of time into, into uh, a short statement here. But he said, hey, let's start an online guitar program with the stuff you wrote. And I went, really? You know, I don't know anything about online guitar education. Anyway, he convinced me that we should take a lot of the stuff I wrote and make an online program. And his argument to me was that the internet is full of guitar education stuff, but it's all sort of like an hors d'oeuvre table with a lot of really good goodies, but not a full meal uh, not anything that's structured, not anything that gets into the whys behind why somebody does something. So he had himself signed on to many different of different guitar education websites. I think I'll just leave them nameless. They're good and they're good business models, but they, they seem to um, not be there seemed to be a, a, a hole in the spectrum uh, in the market of where there was, there was nothing out there that was a structured program that was sort of a, a substitute for going to a school like GAT or Berkeley. And so there's a lot of people who would like to go and study music at the col- uh, at the guitar at a college level or study music at, a, at the college level, but they can't afford it or they have a family and they can't move or there's just some barrier or group of barriers that are 
uh, insurmountable. And, but so they never get that guitar education. And all the stuff they find online doesn't satisfy what they really need, which is structure and a systematic way to go through and build their skill level and their knowledge level. So my partner, Todd, who was not my partner then, convinced me to launch this thing. So we started working on this massive online guitar program called Fretboard Biology. And we launched in 2020, the summer of 2020. So we're two and a half years into this. And Fretboard Biology is very similar in scope, I would say, to what GIT's four-year program was and what Berkeley is. In other words, similar in the fact that it starts, it's designed for guitar players, not beginners, but people who've played a bit, but seem to have stalled or are not happy with the speed of their progress, feel like they're having to go to too many places to collect information, or they go onto websites and they're listening to really good players play and explain stuff, but there's, they're lacking the background to understand what, the, what these teachers are saying. And they would like somebody to give them that background. And so because of my experience developing curriculum and managing curriculum and teaching curriculum at both the GIT and at McNally, and at McNally I wrote uh, 90% or more of the guitar curriculum there, I have experience of how to package and group together and organize guitar information. So that's what we did. And that's what fretboard biology is. It is a very structured online guitar program that uh, is incredibly affordable. We're practically giving it away at 29 bucks a month. You subscribe and you pay a monthly fee and you travel through the program at your own pace. You can check it out by going to fretboardbiology.com. When you get to the home page, up at the top, there's a tab that says the program. And it's a good place to go because when you click on that tab, it'll take you to a page and you can see the eight levels, those tabs down the left side. And each level is sort of like a semester of college. And within that level, there are 10 units. And a unit is a like a, you know, some arbitrary length of time. We'll call it a week, although most people don't get through a unit in a week. Within a unit, there's a theory class. There's a fretboard logic class to teach you your, your way around the fretboard, scales, arpeggios, and chords. There's a class called uh, improvisation, which teaches you to use what you learn in fretboard logic and theory to improvise. There's a class on rhythm guitar, which deals with all the things that we do to make a living playing rhythm guitar. There are technique classes within there. There are, and then there's some other ancillary subjects that come and go. So in, there are eight levels. In each level, there's 10 units. In each unit, there are these five classes. And they go all the way through the program. And um, so we have uh, a few hundred students in the program now. They're all on their own pace. The, the way the program is, is designed, I teach the classes on camera. And it's all taped, of course, in advance. We video this. And um, you can watch the videos as many times as you want. You can go back and watch it again and again and again. There are exercises for everybody to do. And it's a good substitute for going to a brick and mortar school. If somebody has the opportunity to go to a music college, I would always encourage them to do that because of the synergy that happens in those places. And, and the inner, you know, the stuff you learn from just being in that environment of a, of a music school, it's great, you know, but most people can't do that. And if you can't do that and you want to travel and learn at your own pace system, Fredboard Biology is really unique. There's really nothing like it online. There's Berkeley online, which will cost you $65,000. We're way cheaper than that. MI is about the same. If you want to go to GIT online, it's really, you know, those things, the, the cost is prohibitive for most people. Fredboard and for Biology. online, it's like, I mean, if you're paying that much, you want to be in person, you want to be with people, you want to be jamming with people, you want to be in the environment. 
yep. at that rate, you're doing online. I mean, it's like, there's really, I've been telling people so many times. It's like, if you're trying to do online education, like, and I'm not trying to bad talk any of those places, but it's like, why? I mean, you're going to get a college education um, uh, from fretboard biology. That's going to be so similar to, to one of those two places. And, and yeah, I, I think what you were saying, like, I feel like, yeah, the in-person thing, I mean, there, there's really hard to replace that experience. And I think you're coming from the place that you did it and I did it as well. And that's a time of my life that like can't be replaced or replicated. And I think it was such a cool, awesome thing to experience was that in person in the college thing. But if you can't do that and you're going online, like, Oh my God, like fretboard biology is like, I don't know why you, that was like the, the, it's like no brainer kind of as far as the expenses at least. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's really, really uh, affordable. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hurts. Well, and you, you under, you under, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's affordable, but like it, you know, I, I see it as this thing of like, there's so many people that I don't think realize when they hear me talk about it on my stuff, it's like the the insanity behind what it is and the, the value that lies there. I mean, there should be thousands of people signed up for this thing and they would be so many people benefiting from it. Um, it's such a, it's such a value. And, um, you know, I, I, I like to think of it though, you know, it, it is a, affordable, but like there are many systems out there that are very affordable that, that carry a lot of value. Like for, for an, for instance, as silly as it sounds, Netflix or like, you know, uh, Hulu or HBO max, very affordable, carry a lot of value. There's a lot of value yep. in that product, but very affordable. And I think that's what forever biology is. It's like a high value, affordable thing that, that like, I've tried to tell people this. I'm like, sign up for it. I mean, and who cares if you don't use it one month, it's $29. Right. I mean, that's how I think of like, I have HBO max 15 bucks a month. Yep. I, I go and watch an HBO max show a couple times a month. And I'm not yep. like, it's so affordable that it's like, I'm just glad that I have it. Like, Oh yeah. In the, in the background, even even it's just such a high value ticket, like a, a high value product that, uh, you know, I've tried to tell people that of like, it's, I mean, you should be perpetually signed up for the thing. Cause it's just, and I feel like there's so much more coming. Like this is year two of the thing. And, and there's so much, I think more to be, be had with, with forever biology. I mean, and that's a whole other conversation that yeah. we have outside here. But. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's so much information uh, and it's, and it's laid out in the right amounts and in the right order. And, you know, uh, without sounding like I'm tooting my own horn, I know how to structure content because I did it for so long and I've watched what works and doesn't work for students. And so I've structured it based on my experience of what does work for somebody moving through material. And, uh, and, you know, we start off simple enough that most guitar players who've got a few years under their belt, they can handle it just fine. Yeah. Know? So, yep. And we work on it all the time. We are, there are eight levels and all eight levels are written. We're now shooting the video for level seven. We, yeah. We've been shooting all this week and we're going to shoot all of February and part of March on level seven. And, uh, I had a student tonight ask about level five. He said, it's level five out. I was like, did you not get the email? And he's like, oh, maybe. And then he went and looked, he's like, oh, I did get an email. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man, it's out. And I was like, why are you already done? He's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not even done with this level. I was like, oh, okay. But yeah, he was very excited. He was very excited about level five being done. Just because I think people who realize actually the value behind it, it's, I mean, I've said people to people, uh, you know, who are probably listening to who will listen to this when it comes out. I mean, I talk about it all the time and it's no joke, but anyway, well, appreciate your, your about time to uh, wrap it up. words about it, you know, and it, it helps. I mean, we, I, I can honestly say we take great care and pride in making sure that all this stuff is done. Well, if you knew how many takes we take, <laughs> oh yeah i mean to get it I'm, right 
Uh, I'm very aware. I've edited the video. Yeah. I have, well, I have so yeah. many times where I'm like, I want to send, I want to like, I, I, there's been times where I've like laughed out loud and wanted to take a video and send it to you. You've, you've laughed out. What do you think we're doing when we're shooting? <laughs> going, did I just say that? You know? Yes, I did. You're like, you're like uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well reading a teleprompter for six hours a day i don't blame you Man, I, I, today I, today and yesterday were, were real brain scramblers um you know we're talking about the modes of melodic minor and and I'm altered sure and linear flat seven low green sharp two and and all these uh, you know we're getting into some of the some really deep water now uh at level seven and uh, writing it was uh <clears throat> a challenge and now teaching it with the teleprompter is, is a whole new challenge, but we're getting totally, there. Yeah, we're I totally know. I mean, there's, there's those moments of the day and I don't know if you have these, but there are those days in front of the camera where it's like your mouth doesn't agree with your brain. And it just like starts to like, like, it's like the, it doesn't even want to move in the correct way. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you, like something comes out and you're like, what the fuck did I just say? And like, why did my mouth just do that? Like I've had that, like I had it today, like where I was like 10 takes and I'd be like, I'd have to like, what? Yep. Like, ugh, like it's really, you're starting to get yeah. pissed off. <laughs> and if you're just talking to someone naturally in a room, you wouldn't have all those problems. No. You know, if you just, if you're, I mean, I taught in the classroom for so long, that interactive environment made it, was really quite easy. And, and the students' questions were always in, important for keeping the class buoyant and uh, effective, you know, all the time, because you had the interaction with the students to keep you on track and help you improvise what you said next. Yeah. But when it's a one way thing where you've got a camera in front of you (laughs) and you're trying to be clean and neat and tidy with what you're saying, it's a different challenge. Thus the teleprompter, which is a great help. Or at least writing it out, having it anyway, that's a whole other conversation, but all right, cool. Well, Joe Elliott, thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. Fretboard Biology, fretboardbiology.com. Um, yep. All that good stuff. And you probably, if if you've made it this far in this, they've already seen the ad, so they know about the 50% off the first month thing, so they can do that. Um, so um, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. We'll be talking to you soon, I'm sure. If you'd like to join my Patreon to get your questions answered by the guests, then you can go to patreon.com slash Mike Salo. There are several tiers there that you can take part in and lots of different perks like pre-recorded guitar lessons or even one-on-one guitar lessons with me. There are live master classes every week for certain tiers. And again, you can go to patreon.com slash Mike Salo to check that out.